All right, here's some news. So, uh, Doge, I uh, I heard a very good podcast today from uh, the Technology Podcast explaining this. I didn't realize this. Dogecoin was always a joke, but I didn't realize how much of a joke. In Dogecoin, they deliberately violated all the things that supposedly made Bitcoin valuable. For example, there's a limit to how many total Bitcoins there will ever be of 21 million, and that is not true of Dogecoin. You can just print more and more and more with no limit. They just deliberately made it violate all sensible rules so it should not be useful for any purpose as a joke. And now people have put billions of dollars into it, and it's going up and down, and now it goes wildly up and down every day, and they attribute this to Elon Musk. So the fact that Elon Musk is going to, every time he tweets about it, it moves, since it's not based on any reality at all. It's really just sort of a measure of how popular it is, like a TV star. And uh, since he's going to do Saturday Night Live, I guess in about four days, and there will definitely be jokes about Dogecoin, that should cause the price to wildly wave up and down. Anyway, um, it is the whole point of Dogecoin is sort of to uh, laugh in the face of anybody who thinks that there is any sanity in investing or any rules or that anything has any real worth or meaning. It's just sort of a uh, like the uh, GameStop thing. It's a uh, generation of sort of angry people with money and no idea what to do with it. And the whole uh, cryptocurrency scheme is a giant pyramid scheme, which is what I used to do under contract to the Federal Trade Commission, is refund money to people who in pyramid schemes. Is when a bunch of people buy something that has no actual value, the price can go up, but you can't sell. That's why the rule for everybody is hold your, your cryptocurrency, because if you start selling, it will puncture like a balloon, and everybody, the price will fall and fall and fall. As soon as people think it's not going to go up anymore, everybody will just sell and the price will fall to zero and you, and you all lose your money except for the first people that panic. So anyway, um, there's a uh, another big storm going on with Oracle. Um, a journalist wrote an article at The Intercept saying that Oracle is helping China. This Mara Heistendahl or something, she wrote, wrote a story saying that uh, China Oracle is selling technology to China which they're using to do human rights abuses. And that all sounds highly likely. <laughs> that happened a lot. But anyway, um, the Oracle has decided this is completely false. And uh, ah, it looks like they've removed the line. Earlier today, there was a line here in the third or fourth line that said, if you have information about this journalist or her activities, send it confidentially to this uh, confidential email address. Asking everybody to sort of crowdsource finding dirt on the journalist and directly attacking the journalist so they can discredit her uh, to demonstrate that they are all moral and stuff. And uh, then everyone said that just shows how evil they are and so apparently they took that off. But anyway, this is, uh, this is what happens when you make a big corporation angry. They hit you with uh, the dirty stuff. Somebody posted this on Twitter, and I was surprised. In 2019, San Francisco passed an ordinance requiring the government to publish an inventory of all their surveillance technologies, and here it is. All the parts of the San Francisco city government and what um, surveillance technology they have. The airport has got all kinds of stuff. Um, license plate recognition and electronic toll readers, closed circuit television. Um, Art Commission has got some stuff. The Asian Art Museum has got a bunch of things. The city administrator's office has got just security cameras. Anyway, this is pretty amazing. I'm not aware of anybody else that tells you this stuff which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, these links are all on my news um, links, but I'll put that here also if you want it. Yeah, that's an interesting link. Anyway, so um, so the Bitcoin fog, see the problem with Bitcoin, sure, no problem. Bitcoin is commonly um, used to commit crimes. That's its main use case. Uh, the main use case is, of course, investment scams. Uh, that's, but that's mostly the other currencies. Bitcoin is primarily used to perform illegal transactions, like to buy drugs or guns or to make payments to criminals for things like ransomware. And so there's a whole service now. That, the, the problem is everything you do is recorded on a public ledger. It is not secret. Your name is not on it, but your account number is on every transaction. Anybody can go back through the entire history at any time and find out where all the money went. So there are, are services that for law enforcement that will untangle that for you and find out who took the money. 
and there are some accounts full of illegal money that have been frozen in that every exchange that converts it to real money like dollars or um, yen or something has been warned that this is illegal money and don't touch it and so there's a bunch of there's many millions of dollars frozen on the Bitcoin blockchain where they are watching to make sure there's no way to get that money back out anyway um, there's one of the things you can do is you can go to a service like Bitcoin fog which was a Bitcoin launderer that would shuttle your money around among money accounts to make it difficult to track and they caught the guy because he himself did not use his own service he originally set up this service using a defunct cryptocurrency called Liberty Freedom Liberty Cash or something like that which was the predecessor to Bitcoin and that stuff was not anonymous at all so that's how they caught him they tracked down his early purchases used to set up this thing which were not um, protected oh by the way this one here you have to open it in a private window to see it but anyway um that's a fun one all right so this was kind of amazing this the guy that uh, I didn't know I was not aware of this thing called Rocco's Basilisk you may have heard of this story uh, that hit the went around maybe five years ago where they say what if we're all living in a simulation game this is not a real world we're all just fake characters in a computer simulation and how would we know and the answer is well if the simulation was good enough we probably wouldn't know and then somebody said well you know if they ever do that there will be many simulations and only one reality so the odds are good that we are in fact in a simulation and uh, this became a sort of weird religious idea so these guys have another one which is Rocco's Basilisk which says um, suppose that one of us invents a time machine and in the dim and distant future one of us eventually becomes all-powerful and becomes godlike and then they use the time machine to come back and control the world well then they will punish you if you don't contribute to the development of that time machine so what you have to do uh, is make sure that you're helping that time machine get developed something like this I skimmed through it I mean, there's an article written and it turns out that article is what connected Elon Musk to this woman he married who now is the mother of his child uh, they met over this idea which uh, brought them together EFF sent out emails about an upcoming fireside chat whose panel includes Ed Snowden oh okay well that's a good one let me take a look I wouldn't be surprised I think EFF is pretty fond of, of Edward Snowden uh, so are most of the people at Hope um, well it's a good thing to know a live discussion with the whistleblower Edward Snowden coming up on uh, May 5th which is uh, about a week great let me throw that on my news links that's a good idea uh, May 5th I guess I'll throw it on Twitter too it'll take a second but it won't take much time throw it there that's a good point thank you if people might want to tune into that I guess it's worth extra credit if you do it might as well hear what Snowden has to say so Binance uh, the cryptocurrency is now going to trade non-fungible tokens too which are again a ridiculous scam like pet rocks where you pay for something that is not anything at all and uh, the price floats up and down like dogecoin and uh, it appears that the contracts uh, uh, smart contracts in which they're based are insecure and people tend to steal them anyway but anyway uh, it's the latest craze of something to do with your cryptocurrency and that's of course the point once you've invested in cryptocurrency and the number has gone up and you feel rich then you have to keep investing in something but you can't ever take the money out so you throw it from one scam to another so uh, this one um, Brian Krebs says that experience credit freeze is a joke this is you supposedly can do something to add like an extra pin required to change anything about your credit and the idea is if somebody manages to hack into some company and they steal your credit card number or your social security number or something they won't be able to open a new credit account but it turns out that the only information you need to obtain to get uh, a pin is public and publicly available information that's easy to find so in fact it's very easy for an attacker to get your pin and get past it and he's notified them about this years ago and they've just ignored him so he has an article talking about how uh, this credit freeze offered by Experian continues to be completely worthless all right uh, here's this base camp article 
Uh, Basecamp is a San Francisco-based company, and uh, they had this strange article that comes out that said, we will no longer tolerate any political discussions at work or any criticism of our previous statements. Everybody will just do your work and shut up, sort of like a petty tyrant that's been insulted. And uh, after this, of course, things leaked out saying what really happened. And what happened is they had made a list of funny customer names which were often foreign customer names. And they would laugh names that sound like something. And then they decided that was sort of politically incorrect. And people started saying, you shouldn't have made that name. And you're a racist for making that list. And that's what eventually led to some kind of argument that caused the boss to say, all right, I'm passing these rules that we will have no more discussion of political correctness or anything in the office. And everybody will just shut up and stop talking about it. Um, this is the classic stuff, uh, a lot of internet type companies seem to be run by sort of childish petty tyrants that have no idea how to actually treat people. And they, they get, they operate from their personal feelings of being hurt more than logic. Anyway, so now we're up to 128. And uh, we're in the schedule here. And uh, well, let me start with the project because uh, I originally expected this semester, we could finally do a lot of iPhone projects. But what happened is, um, the iPhone operating system got updated a couple times and almost everything doesn't work. And I just tried another one today and it doesn't work. Um, apparently, after about five years of reporting these vulnerabilities and being ignored, my last DEF CON talk, somebody must have noticed a lot of the vulnerabilities have finally been fixed. So Fireserve apparently fixed their apps. I tested some of them and they no longer have this flaw. So I say three of these projects don't work anymore. And um, so there's not that much I know that we can do with an iPhone. However, um, one thing you can do, I mean, that's why this is all extra credit anyway, because not everybody had an iPhone, but uh, that's why there haven't been projects due for a few weeks, and uh, I may or may not be able to get any of these iPhone projects working this semester. I'm not feeling very hopeful. Most of them are not working. However, if any of you want to do research this summer, and you haven't got anything better to do, um, I... Uh, three of us working together would like to get some summer research interns. So I put a link here for it on my webpage, uh, the summer research projects. Uh, I'm open to any good security research. We don't have any money to pay you though. However, the idea is you can uh, discover something either non-technical or technical, and then you can present results in the form of a paper or a talk or a brief talk on our podcast. Or hopefully you can then send it to real conferences like Pacific Hackers, B-Sides and things like that and get your name out. Um, we are not a graduate school, although I kind of wish we were. I can't have PhD students, but I don't, it occurred to me that I don't really care about rules anyway, <laughs> especially now as, uh, as I've discussed, the college is just sort of burning down around us. So why should, but I have fundamental rules to never let the college hold me back. So we will just ignore the details. For people who don't need a PhD, <laughs> but would like to do some research because in, in the security community, a lot of people just cut through all the rules and they just do research on their own and they present it at conferences and then they get a job. And so you didn't really have to pass through academic hoops necessarily. So anyway, if anybody's interested, if you got ideas that are not on this list, that would be fine too. Um, contact me, contact any of us on Twitter. We would like to have some people join us and start doing research and preparing projects. It's, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But I think it might go quite well. Students are, have come to me occasionally and said, can I work for you and get a PhD? And I said, well, you can't really get a PhD working for me, but we may be able to work something out. Anyway, um, so what we've got today is uh, more lecture about the insides of the iPhone, although I haven't gotten much in the way of hands-on projects that work on the iPhone this semester, unfortunately. So we'll talk about the... Uh, Data Protection API and the many layers of encryption on the iPhone and the, the type of binaries that the iPhone uses. So the Data Protection API is really quite impressive. Um, for example, I for a while I started auditing iPhone apps and I was going to audit them the way I audited um, Android apps. And I was going to complain when you stored local data on the phone. And here's a vulnerability from 10 years ago saying they put a file on your phone which has information, personal information that shouldn't be there. But I quit reporting these because my impression is that stuff is so encrypted that it's not much of a risk to store personal data directly on an iPhone. Um, and so here's what they do. It's really quite impressive. 
You have um, encryption keys and protection classes and a secure enclave. The secure enclave is a hardware chip to store secrets that is not part of the file system accessible to the processor, so no malware on the phone can possibly find the keys. Um, and that's, that's considered to be the gold standard for doing this. That's what's used for whole disk encryption on Windows machines with BitLocker. And so you have your passcode. When you log in with your passcode on your iPhone, you have to give it a pen, your passcode, which is like a six-digit number, and then it takes that number and combines it with a device-specific key inside the crypto accelerator, and then it uses that to calculate an encryption key using password-based key derivation function, which is the standard and considered quite good. So it creates a key which is based on your passcode, but not in any simple way or predictable way. And so the UID key that's inside that special chip in your phone is combined with your passcode to create the passcode key. And that, it's, it can also be used to create a device key, and then it creates three more keys, and then it encrypts all the files with one of these other keys, depending on what category you put your file in. So the files are protected by these keys, and when the passcode key is deleted from RAM, all of these become inaccessible, all the ones that rest on the passcode. And there's no way to get them except for you to log in again. And this turns out to be an extremely secure system. So here's the classes. You can have no protection files that don't get encrypted. Complete protection means when the device is locked, they're completely inaccessible. They're behind one of those keys that really means you must have recently or unlock the phone with your passcode. And then there's one, or if a file is in use, it stays unencrypted even when the device is locked. This is what you do for something that has to like, on my phone, even when it's locked, it will pop up like a Twitter page. So this through Samsung's claim that it uses a quantum random number generator. Well, um, I don't know. Uh, by the way, I've heard a few people say that. By the way, there's nothing very special about a quantum random number generator. It's included in all the modern... Um, uh, and all the modern um, Intel processors. All that means is they have a resistor with a current going through it and you magnify the noise. So um, I saw that. The all random number, all hardware random number generators are quantum. As far as I know, they do not have one on the iPhone. But that's not a, not a difficult thing to do. All modern computers have it and it may become the standard. Um, it sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's just a way to make a random number through the random noise of the atoms. and. Uh, it's, not, it's a good idea, though. If most people make quasi-random numbers based on looking at clocks or something, and it's not really perfectly random. Uh, I haven't heard of the iPhone having a hardware random number generator, although it would seem they ought to. With this level of care with encryption, they probably ought to have a hardware random number generator, too. But as far as I know, they don't. Anyway, um, so this is one that will be encrypted from boot up to first unlock, and then it will stay um, unencrypted until you turn it off the machine again. This is the default. All right, so then there's the keychain. The keychain, remember, is the special secure place where you're supposed to put secrets, like passwords or whatever you want to store on the phone. Android has one too. This is where you really ought to put secrets, and it has a whole series of protection classes. You can make things accessible always, or only when the device is unlocked, or only after the first unlock, or um, always accessible, but only on this device and cannot be accessed on another device. Because remember, your keychain can synchronize between devices like your Mac and your phone and your watch and stuff, and you can decide whether you want to allow that or whether you want to limit it to this device only. So this is so you can have any security uh, condition you want with keychain items. All right, and so um, you can't have keychain items when there is no passcode set on the device. And you may remember this was the same in Android. We could not put on a custom certificate in the older version of Android unless there was a passcode on the device. And uh, all right, so it's actually stored here in var keychains, and you can use a keychain jumper on a jailbroken device and get the contents of the keychain. You can also pretty easily dump the keychain on a Mac if you get it while it's logged in. And then there's Touch ID. Um, your book doesn't cover face recognition. And I'm not sure if it works the same way or not. That's what my phone has. But anyway, originally Touch ID would read your fingerprint. So if Touch ID is not enabled, then it does what I've described. The secure enclave has the data protection keys, and the key is discarded from RAM 
when you are locked when your phone is locked so all those locked files are completely inaccessible until you put in your key again but with touch id it holds the key in memory because it's never going to get your pin and then it wraps it with another key that comes from the touch id system this is what it pretty much has to do and i know i'm used to this on my phone i can unlock certain things with my face but then sometimes it says you must put in your pin so i mean that's when it's removed the um the key and it has to regenerate the key from your pin same thing's true of my mac certain activities you really must log in with the password other activities the touch id will work all right and so uh these guys claim they've broken touch id chaos computer club it's undoubtedly true because the way they did it is an obvious one they just took a xerox of your fingerprint and this is a problem uh, the same thing was true of some face recognition systems you could take a picture of your face and hold it up to get in um, that does not work on an iPhone I know because the iPhone actually makes a three-dimensional scan of your face it has to have the right depth too you'd have to have a sort of a full plastic mold or something of the shape of your face to break in and I haven't heard of anybody doing that although I would imagine you could make an artistically made dummy that was accurate enough to fool the face ID but you can't do it with a flat photograph of your face anyway all right and then we should talk about the binaries um, in Windows you have um, PE files portable executable and in Linux you have ELF files executable link format and in iPhone you have Mach O binaries they all do essentially the same job in slightly different ways so it's got a header that identifies um, the format and the architecture it's supposed to run on and then a series of the file layout table that shows it where the symbols are and various encrypted segments libraries and data so it's going to look like this you're going to load commands then you have data here in various segments and this will be used in accordance with the header to load this thing into memory when you run it you can also have multiple mock o files you can write an app and your app might target several different versions of the iphone and therefore it will need different binary file for different versions of the iphone so you call this a fat binary that actually includes a bundle of several copies of your app compiled for different systems and um, here's the older ones for arm 32 for the older iphones and the new iphones use 64-bit arm is what finally got me to upgrade and i wanted 64-bit arm so i could have apple pay which is very nice and uh, apple pay is only supported on 64-bit chips so you can run o tool as a command line tool and it will show you um, which architecture you have the architecture numbers are very mind-boggling cpu type 12 subtype 9 or cpu type this ridiculous number 16 million or something for some ridiculous reason that's what a 64 is 64 is called 16 million <laughs> these are called like all 12 and the subtype tells you so uh, this is true of everything about Apple you know if you just look at an Apple and you want a phone and you want to know if it's an iPhone 5 or 6 it doesn't say that anywhere you have to like go into the settings and find some weird number and Google it to find out which version you have I don't know why they are that way but they make it very hard to tell they don't have a number that's closely related to the internal components it's obviously intentional and I think it dates from the early days of Apple when they would take the um, numbers on the chips and remove them they would try to hide everything about the hardware from the user so you would never try to modify it or alter it and you could only buy genuine devices and if you wanted any service you had to take it back to them uh, this is that was always been apple's position that's why people got windows machines to have the freedom to modify the software and the hardware and linux to get even more freedom to modify the software and hardware the apples are not intended to be modifiable at all by the user you're supposed to be a sealed unit where you just do what apple wants you to do which turns out to be a big hit but uh they they do everything to make it difficult to figure out anything about the hardware so if you want to turn your fat app into an app that only has one architecture use the command line tool lipo and that will remove just the one version to make a thin app which is what you might want to do if you're reverse engineering the app so you can get just one version of it to look at at a time all right so it has all the usual security features that you should expect of any modern software these things are compiled with position independent executable 
and that means that they can be relocated to random areas of memory, which is what you need for address space layout randomization, as we talk about a lot in the exploit development class. This makes it much harder to exploit memory corruption vulnerabilities because you do not know where your app is running in memory. Um, it has canary value, which is at the end of the stack in functions that appear to be vulnerable. It will have a special random number added so that it will detect if you had a buffer overflow from a string going past the end and hitting the return value. It will detect that and cause the app to stop so you cannot take over the machine. And uh, this is the same of all other modern operating systems have uh, canary. Well, Microsoft calls it a stack cookie. It's the same thing. It has this thing I hadn't heard of elsewhere, automatic reference counting to try to deal with um, use after free and double free vulnerabilities, which are heap vulnerabilities. Or, and also uh, when you delete a reference to something or when you delete an object, but you don't delete all references to it because you had two references to the same object, then you can have something that you think you're done using, but there's a way for someone to still write to there. And that turns into a memory corruption vulnerability where I can write to an unexpected location. And this uh, tries to prevent that by counting how many references there are to something. And when you delete it, making sure that all the references are also deleted. So uh, that's a good way to prevent um, heap overflow attacks and you know these double free and use after free attacks. So the binaries that you get from the App Store are encrypted and they have to be decrypted. So you go to the App Store, they have digital rights management, they're decrypted at runtime by the loader, and you can debug crypt them on an iPhone. If you get a jailbroken iPhone, so you run the app, you attach with the debugger, uh, then you dump the memory. Uh, this is very much like the process of how you manually unpack a packed binary, which we've been doing in the uh, malware analysis class. Um, and there's a tool called Dump Decrypted and BF Decrypt. The problem with all these tools is uh, I haven't tested these ones lately. They keep breaking. Uh, the jailbreaking tools keep breaking, and a lot of these support tools keep breaking. Uh, I haven't got them in the hands-on project for that reason. Um, Apple pushes back against all these <laughs> by modifying things. Um, they'll continue to work at old phones, but uh, to make them, the modern phones always have more and more defenses. So anyway, you can do class dump to see um, a list, not the entire source code, but a list of internal classes and such. And you can actually dis disassemble and decompile the app with Hopper or Ida Pro. So the class dump will be like this. It's just a long list of the name of all the uh, variables and methods, like replace card, remove card from array, and so on. So you can get the names of all the methods. And of course, if you use Hopper, it's like Ida Pro or Ghidra. It takes you back down to readable assembly code. And you can read the code of an app and uh, see how it works if you learn how to read this assembly code. It's quite difficult. And I had some examples of this years ago in this class, but you needed to have like an iPhone 4 to do it with what we were doing there. And I haven't got it again this semester. We might, I probably could get back up to doing this Hopper stuff with that jailbroken iPhone with CheckRain, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm probably not going to get around to it this semester. Anyway, let's take a look at some cahoots. I've got them here. And One twenty eight two B, that looks right. People still coming in, okay. All 
All right. Guess that's it. All right. So which key is controlled by Touch ID? That's the wrapping key that wraps around the passcode key. It can't get your passcode from your fingerprint, so it has to wrap it with another key, which is what's connected to the Touch ID. All right, what's the binary file format for iOS apps? All right, that's Mako, good. All right, what key is embedded in the hardware-based crypto accelerator? That's the UID key. All right. All right. What feature mitigates heap corruption? Yep, that's ARC, Automatic Reference Counting. Not the canary. Canary's for the stack. All right. 